discussion of this webinar series, this webinar series on South Asia, uh, and a broad broad coverage of issues uh, on, on on this on the, in this in this series. Uh, we started the series with covering Pakistan, and today I'm absolutely delighted to host Dr. Fahmida Khatun, who is the executive, executive director of the Center for Policy Dialogue, a leading think tank in South Asia. And she accomplished her master's and PhD in economics from University College London and did her postdoctoral research at Columbia University in the United States. Dr. Khatun, uh, welcome to this webinar here at South Asia Institute, so our South Asia Institute. Dr. Khatun will be speaking today of something which is very, very important in the sense, you know, how this pandemic has really impacted some of the growth stories in South Asia. We have seen the case of Bangladesh from become, being a poster child of developmental politics historically and, and a country where there was a lot of focus of international institutions in terms of imparting or offering developmental aid to becoming almost a tiger economy, so to say, as far as South Asia goes and is currently one of the brightest economic growth spots. Uh, an expert on these issues, Dr. Khatun, will be looking at the, you know, she'll be unpacking Bangladesh's growth story and will talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how the pandemic has impacted this growth story and what, what are the paths to recovery? As, as we see, and this is a question, I mean, Dr. Khatun, not just for Bangladesh, but for South Asia at large. But without further ado, the floor is all yours. You might have to unmute yourself, Dr. Khatun, sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Avinash Paliwal, and I would like to thank uh, you and your team at SOAS South Asia Institute for inviting me to this uh, you know, the talk. I'm very honored and humbled uh, to share some of the experiences of Bangladesh's development path and also how the economy has fared during this COVID pandemic. Um, as you have mentioned at the beginning that you know, the story of Bangladesh's development is something uh, which is fascinating, uh, not only within Asia, South Asia, but also across the world. Uh, and um, I will share some of those, uh, you know, growth narratives of Bangladesh, uh, maybe uh, towards the end or uh, more elaborately during the q &A session. But at this point in time, I would like to focus uh, more on the uh, more uh, substantive uh, topic uh, at the moment, uh, uh, by which the, the world economy is affected and uh, also Bangladesh economy has been you know, um, seriously affected. That is the COVID-19. So, uh, so growth story will come along, but uh, you know, as I've mentioned that I will do, uh, dwell with it more, in more detail later on. So uh, just to you know, give, um, taking key from your uh, introduction that yes, Bangladesh has been a star uh, and a stellar performer in terms of economic growth. And in fact, during the last two decades or so, Bangladesh's growth has been quite stable. And the macroeconomic fundamentals have been quite strong um, and uh, steady. And as a result, we see that in the recent past, just before COVID, in, in, during the last financial year, that is in 2019, uh, Bangladesh had experienced a growth of 8.15, which is a very high growth. I mean, at one point in time, of course, India had experienced, China had experienced such growth. And um, it was expected that uh, during a normal financial year in 2020, the growth would have been 8.2%. That was projected by the government of Bangladesh. However, because of COVID pandemic, the economy has been uh, affected through various channels because we know that because of the COVID uh, from the domestic front and also from the external front, the economic consequences have been quite significant. And uh, during a pandemic like COVID-19, um, any economy is bound to have multiple impacts. Uh, so COVID had started with the health uh, issue, but it has expanded to economic and social uh, arena also. So 
Um, in case of Bangladesh, uh, we had the first case of COVID uh, on 8th of March, though COVID had started, initiated in China in December. Uh, so uh, after three months, we had the first case. And then till March, uh, since March till uh, till uh, the 11th of November, that is till today, I mean, today evening. Um, so we have a total number of cases as 4,23,062, and the total death is 6,108. In terms of you know, percentage of affected people, total population of Bangladesh is 160 million. So the, uh, the percentage is 0.26 percentage of cases and percentage of death it is 0 0.0037. In fact, I, I guess it is the you know, second um, uh, highest affected country within South Asia, you know, after India, of course, India has been severely affected being a large uh, economy. So uh, yes, it, in fact, it is the third uh, highest um, country after uh, Maldives and India. Now, the economic fallout, as I've mentioned, that you know, there have been a health, social, and economic fallout, but just let, let us focus on the economic fallout. Uh, there, uh, it is projected that the economy ha will be affected significantly, and various organizations have come up with various numbers. Um, the government of Bangladesh has, uh, has actually, which was projected 8.2%, uh, GDP growth for 2020, the government of Bangladesh has estimated now that in 2020, that is the just the immediate past fiscal year. In Bangladesh, the fiscal year is from July to June. So uh, in, on 30th June 2020, we had the you know fiscal year ended, the previous fiscal year, and we, uh, according to government estimate, it is the growth is 5.2 percent. But as opposed to government estimation, the other international organizations have projected, uh, and which is quite uh, low, actually. If you look at the World Bank estimate, uh, it is uh, for 2020, it is 1.6 percent. Of course, um, these numbers are uh, are reviewed and revised every three months quarterly, and uh, so IMF's number in October, as of October, uh, in for 2020, it is 3.8 percent growth, and IMF has projected that next year in 2020 it will increase slightly, that is 4.4 percent. Uh, and other organizations like Economic Intelligence Unit they also projected that this year. That is the in, in during the immediate past fiscal year it, it is quite low, but next fiscal year it will increase to six percent, six point two. At the Center for Policy Dialogue, we had projected, we had done some projection with limited data, and we had estimated that the growth will be about two point five, as opposed to governments, you know, five point two percent. So, however, there are various, you know, there are many debates about the numbers, but the the a uh, basic uh, understanding is that the growth has been affected. And, uh, um, but the next years, those are uh, you know, looking quite bright. As you know, that just a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks back in October, when the IMF had, um, had uh, published their latest data on uh, growth projections across the country, there were a big you know, discussion that uh, there was a comparison uh, of growth data between Bangladesh and India that, you know, so Bangladesh's GDP per capita is going to be higher uh, than India. So that was uh, quite a discussion. Some had um, really, you know, uh, some were very happy, of course, from the government side, but some had discussed that this is not you know, something to to be um, happy about because uh, these numbers are volatile and we don't know as yet where the COVID-19 will take us. Uh, so this is the growth scenario, but in terms of other uh, you know, uh, aspects, for example, unemployment, poverty and inequality. So those were also uh, going, those are also going to be affected because of the, because of the impact of COVID-19 because uh, several, uh, studies have been undertaken through various surveys, mostly through telephonic survey, because of the pandemic, uh, it's difficult to 
go to you know ask uh, go to people and ask uh, in person so most of the surveys they ha those have um, found that uh, unemployment has increased and also poverty uh, has uh, has increased and as a result inequality which was already a problem because before covid-19 that uh, has also um, that is going to be also increased. In fact, uh, from our center, we had estimated that the poverty rate, which was um, which was estimated to be 24.3 percent by the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, that is apprehended to increase to 35 percent. And in terms of you know people who would be falling into poverty, an additional one 17.5 million people would be you know falling into poverty. So this is, and as a result, as I've mentioned, that the inequality situation, which was quite worse in case of, you know, if, uh, before uh, COVID-19, because uh, the top 5% of the population had an income of, uh, had a share of about 28% of the national income, whereas the bottom 5% own only 0.23%. So the, you can see the, how the inequality has been you know, increasing despite the growth. So the growth narrative has also created some you know some challenges in terms of inequality in terms of creating employment in terms of distributional justice all these issues we can discuss those later on but the channels of the uh, this is not uh, the channels uh, of economic fallout uh, which can be you know which are in fact true for many other countries also so two two channels particularly one is the external channel as you know that um, that bangladesh economy has been in integrating with the global economy uh, in your uh, initial remarks you said that you know, the country was aid dependent during when it was independent but it has gradually graduated from an aid dependent country to a trade dependent country so and through trade through uh, remittances to foreign direct investment through also foreign aid the economy has been integrated with the global economy. So more than 40% of the economy has an exposure with the global economy. So any shock in, at the global level also uh, impacts the Bangladesh economy. So uh, when COVID-19 had started and uh, when the um, you know, services sectors, industrial, industrial production, exports, imports, all uh, had been affected, Bangladesh's uh, you know, exports and also Bangladesh's remittances, Bangladesh's foreign direct investment, all those have been affected also um, since, uh, you know, as you know, one of our two important sources of our foreign exchange income is the exports and particularly the export of the textiles and also remittance income. So that had really have, have initially during the initial period had a really uh, significant impact. The, uh, the channel for domestic impact is that through the distribution channel, particularly one is the production channel, of course, but we have seen that, you know, Bangladesh, uh, like uh, not unlike other countries, that our you know, domestic economy had been had not been that you know dull during the during the you know lockdown situation. One of the reasons is that agricultural production had been quite good, but of course the supply chain had been disrupted. The distribution channel, the marketing that had been uh, you know disrupted, and as a result, you know, domestic prices had been increased and also because the production had been uh, in, within, you know, in the urban areas, production had stopped. Uh, there had been a lot of implications for the employment and income for a large section of population. Many have um, lost their employment and particularly in Bangladesh, about 85% of the people are engaged in the informal sector. So they are, they earn, uh, daily wages and you know for example the drivers the, the house help the tea stall the owners of small roadside tea stalls and all these rickshaw pullers um, the those who work in saloons and all so and the restaurants 
so they had they had been the direct you know uh, victims of this economic shutdown so that uh, through this is so you can see that both uh, domestic and external channels have been quite strong now in view of the implications or the impact of covid 19 the government like many other governments across the world government had undertaken a number of uh, measures and in the form of stimulus package the government says but uh, the stimulus package comprises of two packages in fact one is uh, the fiscal stimulus but the other is the liquidity support because the total amount of stimulus package is you know 12113 million us dollar which is 3.7% of gdp which is a re reasonably good amount but not so good because some countries have you know provided 10% uh, of their gdp even over 10% of their gdp as stimulus packages but you know being a resource constrained country 3.7% to start with is a is not a bad number uh, however as i have mentioned that more than 80% uh, almost 20 82% of this package is in the form of uh loans liquidity support loans from the bank so the banks will provide support to the uh, businesses to the large businesses to the small medium enterprises to the agriculture sector to the export oriented sectors so all these so that is uh, uh, um, uh, that is um, uh, one of the you know ways to support and these will be disbursed through the commercial banks uh, the uh, out of this you know the, the liquidity support support which will be which are being provided by the banks the government will uh, take care of half of the interest rate for example you know 9% out of 9% interest rate uh, for the sme the government will um, will take care of the 5% and the 4% will be you know provided by the uh, by the uh, person or the business which will take the loan so uh, through that you know Way, uh, the government is providing the support otherwise the fiscal stimulus that includes uh, you know of course special support to the initially the support was given to for medical uh, causes to put to the doctors nurses and health workers uh, a special honorarium and then also for the uh, procurement of rice uh, and also some amount for the you know direct support direct cash distribution to the targeted population who are uh, marginalized who are very extremely poor and also in the form of ex um, agricultural subsidies so these are the fiscal stimulus now uh, as i have mentioned this is to start with these are good initiative but the problem and uh, let me also show that you know how bangladesh where does bangladesh stand asian development bank has um, has a estimated or compared the per capita package of uh, you know stimulus packages and in terms of per capita bangladesh's per capita uh, stimulus package is 75 dollar of course because bangladesh has a large population you can see uh, on the slide that bhutan bhutan's per capita package is 571 it's quite you know it's the highest in the south asian countries south asia and also some asian countries i have shown here um, cambodia and uh, also vietnam uh, so maldives uh, also is the second highest with 325 us dollar and vietnam provided uh, 277 per capita so as I, this is just Do to Dr. Khatun, you know, sorry sorry to, yes sorry to interrupt you uh, yes the, the the powerpoint unfortunately is the powerpoint okay, unfortunately okay. is not visible so sunil okay. uh, uh, let me quickly so, yeah. thanks just wanted to let you know about that oh, okay okay let me just quickly i have two uh, you know two sections to i'll very briefly go through those sections the so uh, so what has happened what is the experience so far uh, the initiatives which have been taken and the experience because of the impact of covid 19 what has happened uh, we have seen that you know till today some some of the indicators economic indicators have started to uh, good show positive signs one is the export of ready made garments and the other is remittances so we have initially uh, around april uh, or end of march and in april 
many buyers had canceled their orders. Uh, so those buyers have come back, they have started to reinstate. And as a result, we see an increase in the uh, export, particularly the ready-made garments uh, export. And the second is that we also see a big jump in, in terms of you know, remittance income. So uh, during a crisis like COVID, what are the causes? Whereas because we have seen that many workers have come back, but on the other hand, we see that there is a you know, increase of uh, in, in remittances. The explanation, the plausible explanation is that during crisis period, they, you know, the workers, the, the professionals, they try to send at, as much as they can to their distressed families. This is one. And since, secondly, since many have come back uh, and they don't know when they would go back uh, for work, so they have brought whatever they have, all their savings brought back. And the third reason is also that the, you know, the remittances coming through formal channels, through banking channels, that has increased. And the government has given some incentive, 2% cash incentive, if it comes through banking ch channel, that is uh, one of the reasons. Now, uh, the other also uh, issue is that, as I have mentioned initially, that the agriculture sector had done quite well despite a uh, COVID year. The farmers of you know Bangladesh had uh, had done tremendous job. That is uh, another um, another strong uh, area how when you know the Bangladesh economy has done well. The other you know um, area is that because of the import, uh, lower import, we have seen that the import payment has been low. And at the, in, at the international level, since the oil prices, the fuel prices has been low, that has created a, a cushion for Bangladesh because Bangladesh is a net importer of petroleum uh, uh, oil. So that is, these are the, you know, some of the factors, of course, the foreign funding has also increased during this. Many international organizations, they have come up with, you know, support. So those have worked so far. However, there are uncertainty because still today, we don't know what, you know, road or, or what path will the COVID pandemic take because, and how the other countries will be recovering from this uh, pandemic. That will also determine how fast and how smoothly Bangladesh can bounce back. Uh, this is one. And then uh, lastly, some of the challenges I would uh, mention and I, before I finish, the challenges are that the, the stimulus packages, whatever it is, um, have, those have not been dispersed evenly across the sectors, particularly though the large industries, the export-oriented ready-made garments, they could take advantage of the stimulus package, they could take loans, the small entrepreneurs, they have not been able to you know, access the funds for various reasons, because of their uh, informality, because of their size, and because of their lack of banking records, so we can discuss it later, and also the support to the urban poor. I mean, a lot of emphasis to the rural poor, is given, but the urban poor is often neglected. And also the women entrepreneurs particularly have been you know, in a disadvantageous situation within the MSME, uh, yeah, uh, MSME sector. And uh, that's why uh, the, the future road to recovery will have to focus on three, you know, three pronged approach looking at, by looking at the health, economic and social sectors. Uh, in order to you know, recover and bounce back, firstly, this is a health crisis. And as has, uh, we have been discussing all along, even before COVID period, that health sector suffers from lack of resources. Adequate investment is uh, needed at present. Bangla in the health sector in Bangladesh, that receives only less than 1% of GDP. With this limited resource, the, you, know, you can imagine uh, how, what, you know, how efficiently we can uh, distribute or dis, uh, uh, distribute the health services. This is one. The, on the economic front, uh, the, uh, firstly, in, there is a need for more support, more stimulus packages, more uh, cash in support to the poor. But for that, we also need fiscal space. As we know that we, uh, being a you know, least developed country, we are graduating. We can discuss it later. That's another issue of Bangladesh's you know, uh, growth uh, narrative, positive growth narrative. But 
being a least developed country, we have extremely low take tax GDP ratio. So in, unless and until we can increase the tax GDP ratio and uh, our revenue income, there is limited fiscal space because as we know during COVID, uh, so the international community has also, you know, um, priorities to distribute across the uh, world. So we don't, even if we have more demand, we can't have more resources from outside. So we have to generate from our domestic uh, sources. This is one. Uh, the other, you know, area is that, of course, uh, during COVID, there have been a lot of social uh, implications, social impact. One is that, uh, because of this uh, lockdown and because of the limited mobility, the education sector has been extremely affected. Um, the schools and colleges and universities, a limited number of educational institutions can, could provide um, the online education, but most of the students are outside this facility, uh, particularly in the rural areas. So uh, Bangladesh had achieved quite, you know, um, made quite significant achievement in terms of gender parity in case of primary education. And it was going to narrow the uh, differences between uh, girl, children, girl student and may, uh, boy students uh, at the secondary level also. But the COVID has, you know, uh, we apprehend that COVID has, is going to widen that gap. And we also observed that uh, the, the girls, uh, they are being married off by their parents uh, at an early age during COVID because they don't, you know, the, the poor parents do not want to take the responsibility. This is a burden uh, on their uh, family. So they want, they are marrying their daughters off, which will have an impact on the maternal mortality and child mortality because these girls will have now, uh, you know, will bear children at an early age. So this will have uh, you know, an impact on the uh, overall health situation. So there should be also imp improvement uh, and investment for human capital. So this is another area. I think I'm running out of time. I should stop here. So broadly, what I try, I try to mention that uh, more investment across the sector and more investment for also generating employment and increasing the domestic demand in during financial crisis, the revival of domestic demand is crucial. And through that, the economy can you know, revive and uh, bounce back. So with these words, I end, but I would be happy to answer uh, the queries and questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Khatun, thank you so much for such a comprehensive outlay of Bangladesh's economic crisis because of the pandemic, uh, the various challenges it faces, but also kind of outlining in considerable detail how they can be tackled. I have I have a list of you know very fascinating I mean points which I jotted down which struck to me and I have some questions. But before I I kind of go into my own round of questions and thoughts, I would like to kind of open the floor for our, our participants. And if any of you are interested in asking a question, making a comment, please use the Q and A section below. You can see it in front of the. Uh, on, on your screen or else if you want to kind of ask the question directly, just raise your hands and I'll give you the platform. Please do remember to introduce yourself. So before I move ahead, any questions at the moment? All right, in that case, I'll start with a question myself. Dr. Katun, you mentioned you, st you, you mentioned about a package, a national package that has been offered by the government of Bangladesh, uh, of which you said 82% is to support liquidity. And when you were mentioning that all the furlough schemes that are going on in the United Kingdom, where people are being paid almost 80% of their salaries from you know government pockets, still now it has been extended till March. The quintessential question here is where does this 82% of package where the government is disbursing money to the banks, where are these funds coming from? Is it from a national reserve that is being now being depleted or is it something, you know, where is the revenue generation really happening from? Because if we are looking at a prolonged pandemic, that is an issue that will become very pressing, especially with the kind of 
you know, both the social implications to which perhaps I'll come in a, in a second, uh, but financially, this seems very difficult to sustain beyond a point, especially if, if the trade dependent economy doesn't go back to, to that kind of that, those levels of trade. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay, um, thank you very much. This is a really very important question that where does this money would come from? So this 82%, which is a large amount of money. Um, when the government had um, announced this package, they had, as I have mentioned, that they had given the responsibility to the banking sector, that banks will provide. However, um, as you know, that banks have their own, you know, uh, credit portfolio and credit activities. On top of that, this amount of money, where would the money come from? So in order to create liquidity, the government had taken, or the central bank, I would say, the central bank had um, taken some monetary policy measures. One is that they had um, uh, reduced the uh, CRR, that credit uh, reserve ratio, uh, to create liquidity in the bank, and also the uh, improve the advanced deposit ratio, that is, so also, so these are the two important policy measures they had taken to create a liquidity space and they had been. So, uh, and apart from that, I think the banks themselves also could, um, could have some space in the sense that during COVID, they, um, some of the business activities, most of the business activities were low. So the regular credit uh, disbursement uh, were not probably there was no probably there was less demand from the businesses to you know on the uh, on the credit so so far uh, we have not heard uh, any you know any situation where the banks are unable to provide rather what has been allocated or what has been earmarked those have not been utilized so far because particularly as I, during my presentation, I mentioned that particularly the allocation for the small and medium enterprises, uh, that has not been dispersed. I think, you know, not even half less than about 20 to 30% only have been dispersed. The only sector um, which, has, which could access the fund is the export-oriented ready-made garments. They could quickly because they are large, uh, you know, industries and they are very uh, apt also in terms of accessing, doing the, uh, completing the uh, um, uh, the formalities. But in case of the small and uh, medium enterprises, what has happened that many of many businesses, the smaller ones, they are not, uh, you know used to transact in the, with the banks. Many smaller ones, particularly those which are owned by women, they don't have a record, credit record with the banks. Now, when this, this uh, uh, measures have been announced, um, so the banks, the central bank had uh, requested or the advised the banks to, to disburse the loans on the basis of bank client relationship. But these businesses do not have any relationship with the banks. So, and the banks also do not want to take the risk of providing loans to someone they don't know, someone which is new to the system. So as a result, there's a huge problem. Though the, you know, though the, the central bank has provided um, you know, credit guarantee scheme, uh, um, but still, because of the informality of the, because many of the businesses, they do not, they are not registered. They do not have a trade license. They do not have a, a you know, the tax um, number. So we call it tax uh, identification number. So they're not into the formal system. So as a result, they're facing the challenges of accessing the fund. So those funds are still uh, unutilized. So till now, uh, what I, uh, we have observed that the uh, the support the liquidity crisis has not been so uh, you know so difficult liquidity has been uh, adequate so far but we don't know when we recommend that more stimulus packages are needed then how the government will you know generate or the central bank will create liquidity space that is a question whether you know probably they will have to cut down the rates uh, further 
and take other measures. I mean, of course, there have been also discussion that you know, uh, printing money is another way. Uh, but again, there are debates, you know, whether to go for printing money or not. That's a big debate in a country where the banking sector itself is also is suffering many uh, governance-related challenges. Thank you so much, Dr. Khatun. We have questions from the floor now. We have three questions. I'll start. Uh, the first question is by Samia, and I'll literally just read this out. Thank you so. Thank you for your illuminating lecture on the current economic condition in Bangladesh. Just thinking from another perspective, where does Bangladesh place its ongoing refugee crisis in the midst of this newly emerging economic crisis? A good question, especially you know with with, with the situation. Uh, the Rohingya situation and the numbers that we are looking at in and around Cox's Bazaar and the debate around Bhashan Char and relocating them to, to that island, a controversial debate. But where does the money come for, for those kind of issues, which are very deeply humanitarian, but, but also very, very, very challenging? Okay. Um, yes, this is a very important question because uh, even before the before the COVID crisis, the situation of the Rohingya um, uh, refugees uh, wasn't very good because, um, because they were living in a situation which is not quite comfortable. But on the other hand, the, since this was an international crisis, and this was a crisis also which was uh, imposed on Bangladesh, which, uh, and as you know that Bangladesh being a country with limited resources, is not in a situation to support all these you know, uh, refugees for a long time. So international community had uh, come forward. Many organizations had given you know, support, direct support, and uh, others were taking you know, care of their livelihoods. Some were taking care of the uh, health aspects, some were providing education. So during COVID situation also, it is quite risky because it is a health crisis. And, and as we know that, in order to contain uh, the spread of COVID, some certain health protocols are important. That, and one of these is to maintain physical distance, which is very difficult in a situation, in a place where the Rohingyas live. But however, many international organizations are working, even not only international organizations, Bangladeshi uh, organizations also, for example, BRAC, organizations like BRAC, um, they are also working on health, health issues. So they, uh, within limited um, uh, you know, capacity, the, the Rohingyas are being taken care of. Thank you, Dr. Khatun. This next question is by Giovanni Valencisi. Uh, again, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Considering the relatively stable fundamentals, is the government considering debt monetization in order to respond to this crisis? And secondly, business environment reforms could be a low hanging fruit since they could have limited fiscal impact but unleash private sector initiatives. Is there any discussions on these issues at this point? Um, yes, thank you, two important uh, question. Uh, at this point in time, there is no uh, you know, discussion on or no consideration regarding the debt monetization, you asked, yeah, debt monetization uh, till, till now. So that's not in the radar uh, till now. The, secondly, of course, the you know, business environment reform. Uh, definitely, because this is a perennial issue, we have been discussing about investment, more investment, um, in order to have more employment generation, because uh, as we, though the country is progressing at a high, at a very fast pace. However, if we look at the investment GDP ratio or the employment, which I have mentioned already, that is not as expected. Uh, private investment is hovering up around 23% uh, of GDP for the last five, six years or so, which is not um, adequate for a country which aspires to become, uh, you know, to become um, an upper middle income country by 2030, and also which wants to, um, ex ex you know, have a growth momentum above eight um, percent. So the private investment is crucial, though to some extent the government, the public investment is increasing because we have 
seen that we have been seeing that a lot of large infrastructure projects are now ongoing but in order to have more employment private investment is crucial and why the private investment is not coming that is a big question um, why are not they uh, encouraged many uh, issues are attached to that of course one is that the issue of infrastructure development however for the last couple of years as i've mentioned that you know large infrastructure project projects are being undertaken and um, the issue of the you know, power supply adequate power supply that problem has also been resolved but i what you know the many would uh, you know argue that there are some uncertainty which is though we have a stable or uh, or a political you know stability at this moment in time but for some reasons the private sector investors are not comfortable or confident to invest um, uh, this is uh, and as a result of low private investment foreign direct investment is not also picking up because any foreign investment would look at the private investment rate before they come to a country so from that they would judge to invest to whether they would invest in the country or not of course that's um, a number here you have talked about or recommended for uh, the in business environment reforms some of the reforms apart from infrastructure is of course the reduction of um, red tapism bureaucratic uh, you know uh, increasing the bureaucratic smoothness uh, the time lag and of course some also say that there is also demand for reduction of corporate tax and also the improvement of governance in other words the the perennial problem or a least developed for a, in a least developed country or poor economies or even developing economies in south asian economies in african economies in many developing countries also corruption is an issue so that also these are the you know factors which forbid or which discourages the private sectors to invest Thank you, Dr. Khatun. There are words of appreciation coming in for you from Bangladesh. Uh, but, but I mean, you mentioned private sector, and there is a question that one of the, the you know, the, one of the questions here is, you know, what can be done to attract more invest private sector investment by Dan Pasha? And I'll come to some questions before uh, that in a second. But just to kind of push a little bit on this issue of the relationship between private capital and the political situation in Bangladesh. Now, you did mention that there is political stability in, in, in Bangladesh. The Sheikh Hasina government, you know, it won a mandate, uh, somewhat controversial, but still a, a strong, clear mandate. Uh, but we do know that there are concerns about, you know, a, a relatively heavy handed dealing with the opposition as well at the same time. You know, we know that the dissent against the Awami League is also something which is very considerable. Do you think that that degree, that kind of security concerns might be fueling or might continue to fuel concerns within the, the private sector economy? So is there a link between, between these two or you think they're actually not that connected? The rise, you know, all these attacks that we saw uh, in, in, in the bakery, in the Dhaka, you know, this, I think a few years ago there were attacks by Islamic State elements, there are attacks of you know the neo, uh, the you know basically the re relationship of the BNP with the with the more Islamic right. Is that a concern in your view that remains, or it's not really a concern as far as the economics of the situation goes? Okay, uh, the issue of you know uh, rise of Islamic forces and as a result of which the incidents uh, had happened. Uh, um, a couple of years back, I think over time that has um, that has faded away a little bit because the government, uh, as you have mentioned, heavy-handedly uh, controlled or you know took over the situation, controlled the situation to a large extent, um, and because of that, the fear was that foreign direct investment might be hampered, but we haven't seen. Uh, you know, a radical reduction, significant reduction as a, as a result of that. Yes, initially there was some apprehension that whether this will be a, you know, a secure place to invest because investment comes in, in, a, in bulk and in, in a, for longer term. It's not a matter of two, three years, but you know, for a longer period. But we, as I've mentioned that you know, over the 
uh, within one or two years, that that has I think faded a bit, and the confidence has regained. But the issue is not, you know, I would say this issue is not about the security aspect, but rather the other uh, aspects I would mention the governance issue, efficiency in the management, efficiency in the bureaucracy, all these are more important right now because if um, an invest, because security issue is also, it's not unique to Bangladesh also because that's also a, an issue which is global, which is universal. It can happen to any country. Um, so, the, and that has been taken care of to some extent, but the other issues, the corruption, the governance issues, institutional strengthening, these are the issues which are more important to an investor. And as I have, I have mentioned, though many economists uh, also debate on the issue of corporate tax, but we what we have observed that there is a large demand from the corporate sector to for reduction of corporate tax. This is another uh, issue. So these are more important issues. And also skilled human resource. This is another thing because invest for investment, you not only you know, need technology, technology would come with FDI, but some, some degree of efficiency, human resource efficiency is important for that. So those are more important factors than the security aspect, I would say. Thank you for the clarification, Dr. Khatun. On that note about institutional kind of resilience, there is a question by Mariam that this year Bangladesh has been experiencing some of the worst flooding on record. Has COVID and its socioeconomic disruption affected government's flood response? Or do you think that it can affect government's flood response? Uh, yes, I would say to some extent, because we had, uh, from our center, we had undertaken a study and uh, we had uh, looked into the implications of flood and how this dual uh, challenge, flood on the one hand and then COVID on the other hand, um, how they have affected the you know, recovery. And indeed, uh, because of the COVID-19 situation, um, many, you know, the, or the support which were otherwise could have been provided to the flood affected people that had been um, low. So I would say yes, a short answer is that because of uh, COVID um, and, and COVID induced disruption, the flooding uh, or the victims of flood, they uh, many had not been you know, able to get adequate support. Thank you, Dr. Khatun. There's a question by Katinka Everston. You mentioned that women entrepreneurs have especially have been especially disadvantaged throughout the COVID crisis. Could you elaborate on that? What are the dynamics that make women entrepreneurs more disadvantaged? This is this is a question. I mean, it's you've covered part of you know you've addressed it in, to some extent already in your in your sessions. But this is something which is very important in the sense that we. For me, when I looked at look at Bangladesh's economy, part of the reason for the success is also the inclusivity, the gender inclusivity that that has been that has been demonstrated in the past few years. When when you know it has almost coincided or almost caused, if not entirely, then definitely partially and strongly, Bangladesh's economic revival. How do you think is that fundamental revival at risk because of this gendered kind of gender disadvantage that that the pandemic promises? This is a very question, a very important question too, because uh, during my presentation also, I was trying to uh, bring up this issue that women's contribution to Bangladesh economy has been significant in the labor market, but, uh, labor force participation is about 36%. But apart from this, in many ways, all women in Bangladesh, rural women, urban women, they are, integrated into the economy in one way or the other and uh, and that's why we see that you know the one of the reasons as you have mentioned that bangladesh's economic progress has been uh, made so far because of the contribution of women now because of covid 19 situation many women entrepreneurs who are in a disadvantageous situation and we have, we are currently undertaking a study on the impact of COVID-19 on women entrepreneurs and how stimulus packages have reached to them. Um, so surprisingly, or maybe naturally, you can say that 
many, most of them have not been able to access the fund. And, uh, and sadly, many don't even know uh, regarding the presence of the uh, stimulus packages that such a, um, such a stimulus package has been announced. They are not aware of them. Lack of information is one important barrier for them. And many, of course, as I've mentioned, do not have the, you know, the capacity to com you know, comply with the formalities which are needed for the government. So I would say that because of COVID, there is an apprehension of widening gender gap. Bangladesh had done very well during the Millennium Development Go uh, Goal uh, achievements. Uh, it was a stellar performer in achieving the Millennium Development Goals, and it had also achieved goals with regard to gender empowerment. However, COVID uh, might you know, reverse many of the achievements, or it might undo many of the achievements which have been done. And during my presentation, I have also mentioned the you know, widening gap between the you know, uh, girl children and male children or boy children in terms of education. So through education, through economic opportunities, uh, there will be, there is an apprehension that the gender gap will widen. Therefore, we are you know, demanding specific targeted support for the women and for the entrepreneurs and also direct cash support to the those who are really you know behind and there are special types of groups you know the transgender community the those who, and also the uh, other marginalized groups who are beyond the radar of the you know policy makers or uh, radar of our um, of us so those are not being able to take advantage of the facilities or the benefits which are announced by the government. Dr. Kadum, there's a question by Rizal who says that the ready-made garment sector has, was reviving, uh, you know, from the impact of COVID. But now in the US and UK and Europe broadly, we are seeing the second wave hit. We are right now, I mean, uh, we are living under lockdown. So, so do you think that is going to impact the export of Bangla, you know, ready-made garments from Bangladesh. Would that be a significant issue? Yes, uh, definitely, because um, particularly Bangladesh's export to the EU market is very significant, and also US followed by USA. And um, though uh, in August, July, August, September, uh, the many of the orders have been reinstated, the buyers have come back, but with the second wave, uh, this is this may not be, you know, the momentum may not be continued uh, because, uh, because of this COVID-19. We are hoping that uh, during Christmas, there might be more new orders, more orders, but uh, now with the situation which are being observed in the European countries, many countries are going back to lockdown and many countries are you know, shutting the, their uh, economies. And so this is going to have an impact on the RMG sector, but it is also expected that once, um, as soon as the, the other, you know, the European economies or the US economy bounces back, uh, then Bangladeshi exporters will be able to take advantage of this. Thank you, Dr. Khatun. I, you know, in my, in my, you know, when I'm working, I usually focus a lot on India's relationship in my own scholarship with its neighbors and Bangladesh is, is a very important relationship. I can't resist but ask, how does the government in Dhaka actually view the kind of narrative coming out of New Delhi, especially Sorry? how does Dhaka view New Delhi's approach in terms yes. of trying to, trying to support regional countries in, in you know facing facing the brunt of the pandemic, especially with Maldives, we have seen a lot of public diplomacy happen. Uh, you know, where New Delhi is saying that look, we are sending uh, we, are, we are sending support to to Malay, uh, and similarly they are trying to portray themselves as as a, a net provider of security. Uh, you know, in, in at the point of uh, du during the pandemic, do you see much uptake, and do you see you know Dhaka takes New Delhi seriously? when it comes to dealing with the pandemic, given, given India's own kind of economic situation and, and the relative inability to handle the pandemic itself? 
Um, yeah, this is a very uh, very important question, and I'm happy that you have raised. Uh, I also wanted to touch upon that the you know regional cooperation aspect of it, and we have uh, seen that uh, at the beginning of this COVID outbreak, COVID nineteen outbreak, um, there have been initiative uh, in within the SAR framework that there's a fund where Bangladesh government had also contributed, the Indian government had contributed. So this was a very good initiative, I would say, particularly in the context when we see that SARC has become dysfunctional. It is uh, almost a dead organization and we have not seen any activities or any initiative during the last couple of years. So uh, any regional cooperation within the South Asian you know, context is, very, uh, is, is a very encouraging uh, initiative, I would say. And I, and I, I see the lot of opportunities are also there. Um, uh, we have seen that you know already India is manufacturing COVID medicine, the vaccines, and there has been commitment from the Indian government to provide uh, vaccines. Bangladesh, as the um, as part of the neighborhood first policy, we see there are some uh, initiative to provide the vaccines uh, to Bangladesh. This is a good initiative, and I think there are. In the recent year, uh, recent during the last you know couple of weeks, I would say that we see a renewed uh, initiative in terms of support, particularly in view of the COVID-19 situation, in view of dealing with the impact of COVID-19 situation. So I think this is also an opportunity for reviving reviving the regional cooperation and also to have an entry point after a long time. Uh, this could be an entry point for regional cooperation. Oh, I'm really? uh, optimistic about it. Uh, it's, it's very nice to hear someone being optimistic about regional cooperation in South Asia, but I'm not surprised that it is coming from someone in Bangladesh because the view from Delhi and especially Islamabad, given the geopolitical situation looks very grim. Dr. Khatun, thank you so much for your enlightening session. Such, you know, it, it, it was, I've really kind of learned a lot, and I'm sure so have all our participants this afternoon. Uh, as you say, there is a lot at stake here. There's a lot at stake for the people of Bangladesh, for the Bangladeshi economy and the region. But let's hope that the responses and the packages that the government has kind of initiated do reach the, 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 the recipients and the issues of distribution, of course, never easy to address. But, uh, but I hope that there is some degree of thought and, and action on, on those sections which are marginalized, uh, but are actually very important in the, in the economic growth and upkeep of Bangladesh. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who uh, were able to attend the session. It has been recorded and will be put online, uh, if I remember correctly. But uh, before I sign off, I would like to just make another announcement of the third webinar that we'll have. It will be on the issue, it'll be next week on the issue of ongoing India-Pakistan tensions and how these two countries, especially you know, after what uh, Dr. Khatun said about the inability of SARC to kind of come together, but she still remains hopeful, whether India and Pakistan are themselves hopeful about having some sort of a conversation going, something that is badly needed, not just because of the pandemic, uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, whether that is possible at the moment or not, please join us next week for the third webinar in the South Asia Institute uh, webinar series. But once again, Dr. Fahmida Khatun, thank you for joining us from Dhaka and wish you all the best and have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye.